Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about general linear maps, general vector spaces, matrices and related stuff. And in today's part 29, we continue our discussion from the last video about equivalent matrices. Indeed, we will see that the rank of matrices is related to this equivalence relation. However, before we go into the proof of that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, with the link in the description you can download additional material for all the videos. For example, there you also find my whole book about linear algebra, which is helpful for learning all that stuff. Ok, with that said, we can start recalling what we have learned about equivalent matrices. Indeed, we have an equivalence relation for matrices of the same size. So in general, we could say that we have two matrices A and B of size M times N. And these two matrices can be equivalent, which we denote by a tilde in between. And as we have learned, this means that they can both represent the same linear map. So the linear map we can call L and the vector space V has to be of dimension N. And on the other hand, the codomain, the vector space W is of dimension M. So again, equivalence means that both matrices can act as matrix representations for the linear map just with respect to different bases of V and W. And moreover, we have also learned that we can describe this property without using the linear map at all. This works by taking invertible matrices, which we can call S and T, such that we can write the matrix B as the matrix product S times A times T. Indeed, this is the definition one can easily remember and now we have a natural question, namely, do we have an invariant under such an equivalence operation? So we could ask, is there something in the matrix which does not change while doing these matrix multiplications? For example, it could happen that the kernel or the range of the matrix does not change when we form this matrix product. And I would say, we can immediately check that for the kernel of the matrix B. And in the case that A is equivalent to B, we can immediately write this as the kernel of SAT, which is by definition the set of all vectors in Fn, which satisfy that SAT of X is equal to the zero vector. And there we immediately see we can multiply on both sides with the inverse of the matrix S. So we need that ATX is equal to the zero vector, which means that TX has to lie in the kernel of A. Hence we recognize the relation between the two kernels. Each element in the kernel of A has a corresponding element in the kernel of B. And obviously the matrix T makes the connection here. So in short we could say the kernel of B is T inverse the kernel of A. Or vice versa, the kernel of A is T times the kernel of B. Hence, by this formula, we have the conclusion that the kernel could definitely change under our equivalence operation. Therefore, in the next step, let's consider the range of B. There we can do the same thing, we just have to know the definition of the range again. It's simply the full image, so we take a vector x and go through all possibilities. And there we see the same as before, we can use the invertibility of the matrix T. In short, if x goes through all vectors in Fn, then Tx goes also through all vectors in Fn. This means instead of Tx we can write x tilde and then we have a shorter description of the same set. And moreover, we also see that A times x tilde will give us the whole range of A. In other words, here we also get a nice formula for the range of B, we get that it is S times the range of B. So there we have it, this is how the range transforms under the equivalence relation. This means it's definitely possible that the range also changes. So in summary, we get that the kernel and the range 
are not invariants under the equivalence transformation. However, now we found out that the dimensions of the two things are invariant. Simply because the invertible matrix here on the left will not change the dimension of the space. So let's write down the result. If A and B are equivalent, then this implies that the rank of A is the same as the rank of B. And please never forget, rank of a matrix is simply a short notation for the dimension of the range of the matrix. And moreover, we have the same thing for the nullity of the matrix, where the nullity is the dimension of the kernel. Okay, there we have our nice result. If the two matrices are equivalent, then the ranks coincide and the nullities coincide. However, rank and nullity are not so different, because you know they are connected by the rank nullity theorem. Namely, no matter what we have, they always add up to the numbers of columns of the matrix. So in our case here, this would be always given by the number n. So this means we don't need to talk about both dimensions here. If we know one, we also know the other one. Hence, it's sufficient just talking about the rank of the matrices. And then the next question is, do we also have the converse implication here? This means if we take two matrices of the same shape and with the same rank, do we also know that they are equivalent? And as we have stated at the beginning of the video, the answer is yes, equivalence is completely described by the rank of the matrix. So we have A is equivalent to B if and only if the rank of A is equal to the rank of B. This means the rank is the invariant we searched for and it tells us that the rank gives us the equivalence classes in the space of matrices. And indeed the proof here is not so hard because we only have to write down one implication anyway. And moreover, we already know how we can transform matrices with the Gaussian elimination. And in the whole process of the Gaussian elimination, we only multiply with invertible matrices. In other words, what we get out is still equivalent to our original matrix. And in addition, you know what we get out is what we call the row echelon form. We use that name because it has a nice stepwise structure. And moreover, on the steps we find the so-called pivots and the number of pivots is also equal to the rank of the matrix. Indeed, all of this you should know from my linear algebra course. There you also learn that in order to solve a system of linear equations, we also do a backward substitution in the end. In the matrix notation, this simply means that all the pivots are scaled to 1 and all the other entries in the matrix are set to 0. Hence, we just have row and column operations, which can also be expressed as multiplying with invertible matrices. Therefore, the important part here is that we still get out an equivalent matrix. And then you see in the last step we can also do a column exchange, which is also given by multiplying with an invertible matrix. More precisely, this is given by a permutation matrix, which is always invertible. Okay, so now the result here is that every matrix A can be transformed in this way and then it's equivalent to a matrix which has an identity matrix in it. Indeed, the size of this identity matrix is exactly given by the rank of A. So let's say we have the number R given as the rank of A. And there we see it, if our matrix B has the same rank as A, we can do similar transformations to reach this form in the end for B as well. So we get that B is equivalent to the same matrix and by the transitive rule of an equivalence relation, we get that A is equivalent to B as well. And there we have it, the rank of a matrix completely describes the equivalence transformation. So please remember, if the rank is different, the two matrices cannot be equivalent. And now please note, this also implies that the rank of a general linear map can be calculated by using a matrix representation. So you see, it does not matter which matrix representation we choose, because all of them have the same rank. 
And more about that, I would say we can discuss in the next videos. So have a nice day and bye bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.